morning. I know because I already heard a stomach or two growling. And I also remind me to say grace for the food when we have the benediction here. Would you do that for me? You'll remind me of that. We're starting a new sermon series today. It is, uh, I think, me, my opinion, it's the logical next step after we spent Lent and Easter talking about loving our neighbor. I thought long and hard about this when Francis was bringing all those wonderful messages to us about what's the next step you take after you know that you need to love your neighbor. Well, mission and outreach is at the heart of the gospel. And for years, everyone, we in the church especially, have depended on these special people. We call them missionaries. We depended on them. We, uh, we, we wanted them to share the gospel, to go out and feed the hungry, clothe the needy, and provide shelter to those who were without. And you know, today we still depend on those missionaries, but we recognize that there's more that we can do than just support the missionaries. Now, one of the things that I like about missionaries is they really are talked about in the Bible. And it's not in the same way that we always think about them. Missionaries knew and know that God wanted every person uh, to know that they were loved. That's something that the missionaries have always done. Missionaries know that God wants the story of that love in Jesus Christ shared, as I told the kids, from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. Missionaries know that God wants equality and justice for all people. And what did Jesus do to make all of those things happen? He established the church. He established the church to continue the work after he went to be with God the Father. Now, missionaries are not the only way that, that God has to fulfill the Great Commission. And I was doing some research this week. Wow, 41% of the world's population have never heard about Jesus. That's an estimate. 41% of the people in the world have never heard about God's love. They don't know what these missionaries know, that God wants justice for all people. So this story of God's redemption, there's plenty of people out there for us to share it with. What we're going to be doing in the next few weeks is talking about power shifts. Power shifts. We're going to cover through this series how we can make personal power shifts in our lives to help increase the outreach that we can do, the way that we can do these things that some of the missionaries do. Because if we can make small changes in attitude, actions, I bet you can figure this out. What are we going to talk about? Attitudes, actions, alignment, abundance, and anointing power shifts. We can turn those statistics around. So the question to start with today, why are you on the planet Earth? Why am I? On the, why are we on the planet Earth? And I think that uh, Jesus had two fundamental, foundational ways of answering that question that he talked about when he was preaching and teaching. And one of them you will recognize because we just talked about it in one. But I'm going to read that scripture and then the second right now. The great commandment, which is what we based Lent and Easter on. Teacher, why is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Now we spent Lent and Easter talking about loving God, loving all human beings, loving all things that God created as being an important focus and purpose for our lives. Then Jesus had a second commandment teaching purpose for all of us being on the planet of earth. And that is this from Matthew 28. And he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The word of God for the people of God. So the great commandment, the first one I read, the one we talked about in Lynn, is about love. What I think about that is who we become. We become love. Who we are, we are love. That great commandment, love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself, is about who we are. The Great Commission is not about who we are. It's about what we do because we love. And so that's what power shift I want to talk about. How can we as individuals, how can we as slash church best reach those who have never heard how God saved them through the Son They've never heard about Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. You know, traditional missionary methods have, have enjoyed success over the years. We still send people into the mission field, and they share the story of God's love, and they baptize new Christians, and they feed the hungry, and they offer clothes and shelter, and they share the good news. And it used to be that we would be sending these missionaries to the far corners of the earth. But as we found out yesterday, those of us, I mean, there are people here, you can talk to them after worship. Uh, Mark, Kristen, Harold, David Bremner was there for a cup of coffee. Uh, Julie, Claudia, and tell me your name again. Debbie. Debbie who has been visiting our church uh, and is a friend of Claudia's. Um, who else was there that I'm forgetting yesterday? Any, not anybody else who's in here right now. We found out that the mission field is just right down the road in front of a food lion in Azalea Shopping Center. We found out that it is right up in Hanover County by the courthouse at Moments of Hope food pantry. These people needed to hear about God. They wanted to hear about God. They had things about God to teach me, as I said at the prayer table. The mission field is not in some far off place. It's right here. The power shift we want to talk about is that the status quo of mission just doesn't work anymore. Sending a missionary out doesn't work. I think it's time for us to get up out of the pew and actually follow God's teaching to go out into the world. You remember, uh, there's a parable. Uh, well, the, let me start this way. Jesus' disciples asked him about the best way to share the story of God's love. And he told them a parable. And that parable is about seeds and good dirt and bad dirt, the parable of the sower. And in that parable, one of the things Jesus said is the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus was trying to tell the disciples, you know, like the 
guy who runs the farm, sends people out to work in the field, I'm sending you out to work in the world. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was in that text, the word that is translated send out. I want you to hear what that means in Greek because it is very interesting. It means to eject. It means to cast out. It means to drive out. It means to expel. And don't ask me why, but the first thing that came to my mind as I was thinking about the etymology of that sending out was a frisbee. And I'm thinking that like Jesus trying to send people out into the world, we need like a frisbee. Do not worry. You're so worried back there that I'm going to throw you I, I got guys standing up asking me to throw. Um, I think we have got to spin ourselves out into the world and share and preach and teach. I told you I wasn't going to throw it, and I'm not a little kid. I'm really not going to throw it. I'm thinking about it. I might just go back to it later. Um, <laughs> I think the parable of the sower and the soils that's found in Mark, uh, I mean in Matthew 13, and it's also in Mark 4, illustrates what happens when we follow God's command to share the gospel. Because in that text, he talks about how, oh, the harvest was multiplied in this field 30 times, in this field 60 times, in this field 100 times. But there was something when I was reading that text this week that I noticed, maybe I had noticed it before, but it just jumped out at me. And that was Jesus gave no explanation as to why this field was 30 and this one was 60 and this one was 100. He didn't talk about it being better dirt or more, you know, fertilized. I mean, he didn't talk about any of those details. So what made the difference between this field that was 30 times, 60 times, and what made the difference in that story? You know, the, the yield of the harvest always depends on the quality of the soil. Uh, we, we know that from our experience but it was all the same. What was the difference? What made, why did some seeds have 30 and some 100? We've learned to see, we've learned to love God and love our neighbor. That's what we talked about during the week. How best can we take the next step and go out into the world and share the gospel and instead of getting a 30-fold bounty on our work, get a 100-fold bounty. In biblical days, these farmers, they just used sheer muscle and willpower. They cleared the fields and they tilled the soil and they planted the seed and they harvested the crops and they prepared the grain. And we know today in our time, that they got all this equipment and they have special seeds and special fertilizers and they are doing better work than they did back in, back in biblical times. And they're, they're bringing in a bigger harvest and they're doing more for less effort. And it doesn't make sense to us that our efforts have yielded 41% of the world has not even heard about Jesus. Are you kidding me? We've been working at this for over 2,000 years. We need a strategic missional power shift. We need to change years in the understanding of mission and outreach. And the reality is that going to church today, and writing a check, and putting it in the tray, and then sending a missionary out into the world to spread the gospel and preach and teach is not using all of our resources. And that's how you get a 30-fold harvest. That's not how you get a 100-fold harvest. By sending our members out to serve the needy and homeless yesterday, 
we were putting ourselves in a position to see the world as God sees it. What does that mean? Yeah, we've done that before here at Slash. We do it all the time. And many of you do those kinds of things in your regular everyday life, in the groups that you belong to, in the place where you work. In the Bible, who were the people who saw the world as God saw it? They were prophets. The prophets are the ones who could see the world as God saw it. The prophets were the ones that were asking that justice be brought to the world. The prophets were going out and saying to love God and love others as you love yourself. It was the prophets who did all those things. The prophets had this vision that was given to them from God. They could see and feel as God sees and feels. And folks, that's who the people are who are spinning out into the world from church. They are the people who see the world as God sees it. They see in need. They see someone hungry. They see someone who does not have enough to eat. They see someone who has lost hope, and they tell them the story of God's love, the story of God's support. There's a wonderful text in the Bible in 1 Peter 2, 9. <laughs> it is beautiful. It says, are we not God's chosen people? A royal priesthood. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We are not called just to sit on our laurels. We are called to be out in the world, ejected, expelled from church today. Can you believe that's what sin now means? Expelled out into the world. To see the world as God sees it. To see the world as the prophet saw it. To see a need and step out and change the world. Sharing the gospel with others. That is our call. That is the power shift we want to talk about this week. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, during the next few weeks, next week I will be gone. Our sister, Reverend Rebecca Highfield, is going to bring the message next week, and she's going to continue the series. Next week I'll be in a minister's meeting at Chapman University to see my daughter, Ruthie. Of course I'm going for the minister's meeting. <laughs> wink, wink. Uh, but it will be. It will be a wonderful uh, gathering, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So my thanks to Rebecca and my thanks to Francis Stanley, um, who will also be here at church. Uh, I want to be expelled the first into the fellowship hall to eat <laughs> after this and play Family Feud. I look forward to that. We're going to sing together uh, now. We invite you to sing, show me your words.